Good afternoon and welcome to Education Today. I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. Today we explore the educational life and thoughts of one of Oakland's most renowned educators, former Superintendent Bob Blackburn. Blackburn achieved notoriety when he was shot along with Marcus Foster by the Symbionese Liberation Army in 1973. But his history and education has more fascinating dimensions than this one. Welcome, Bob. Very nice to have you here Thank talking you. with Education Today. I wanted to start out by asking you something about your association with Marcus Foster. Your name is often associated with him because you served as his deputy, and you're now on the board of the foundation that's named for him, I believe, the Marcus Foster Foundation. Right. right. And, Kitty, I want to thank you for having me on. Um, it's a little hard for me to proceed because I'm, I'm very choked up the day of the taping over the loss of um, America's finest political leader, uh, the former leader of the House of Representatives who has been forced out of office, a personal hero of mine, <laughs> and a figure of moral leadership for our entire country. And his loss is causing grief among millions of Americans, including me this evening. <laughs> so <laughs> having now I can calm down and <laughs> proceed with... Somehow I have the feeling, given your history, that this is not exactly your feelings about these events. <laughs> Look, any man who can fly to his <laughs> indictment hearing in a tobacco company provided jet <laughs> has got to be, a, you know, a special kind of guy. <laughs> anyway, you were asking me Thank about... Thank you, Bob. And anybody who can about, make that kind of jokes right. makes a very unusual school superintendent That's right. uh, who yeah. are often humorless people. So we are very happy that you have been a Work school superintendent. <laughs> far too serious to be taken seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You're asking me about Marcus Foster. <laughs> right. So I wanted you to tell us a little bit about Marcus Foster's role in Oakland and your relationship to him. Sure. Um, he just had three years in Oakland. He... Uh, um, managed in those that short period of time to uh, deeply affect the whole community of Oakland, its parents, its teachers, its children, political leaders, business people, and so forth. I have known most of the urban superintendents from the late 60s to the, let's say, early 80s, and he was hands down extraordinary, unusual, and maybe the best. I first met Marcus Foster in 1960 when I was a youthful director of a citizen school reform group in Philadelphia. I took a group of people to, who were visiting schools trying to get an understanding of what was going on in that district to his elementary school where he'd just been a principal for a couple of years. In the midst of a blasted out North Philadelphia ghetto that looked like a place that had been bombed in Poland in World War II, he had a veritable garden of learning going on. Um, he had parents involved, he had local shopkeepers involved, teachers were animated and excited, and every week was something special and new at that school. I was there during Phyllis Wheatley week, and every kid in the school was memorizing poems and was involved, teachers were animated and excited, and every week was something special and new at that school. I was there during Phyllis Wheatley week. And every kid in the school was memorizing poems and reciting. And you'd open a broom closet and there would be a parent tutoring a kid. I mean, the cafeteria staff had an instructional responsibility, as did the custodian. Uh -huh. I mean, it was just a beehive of intentionality and excitement. And I realized, oh my heavens, this is an extraordinary educator. And then he went on to become a principal of a junior high school and then later the toughest high school in Philadelphia. And he just had one year downtown where we worked very closely together. We'd been friends for a decade. And uh, when he got the offer to come to Oakland, I was utterly opposed to his coming. Oakland really? had, his, it had been a vacancy for a couple of years. It was known as a place of trouble and difficulty. And and he, reluctantly, he, he was on a, a visit to Ohio, and someone persuaded him to come to Oakland, at least to talk to the school board about it. And he did. And he felt that because it was about you know, a quarter the size of, or less, a fifth of the size of Philadelphia. It was a size that you could get your arms around. And he was 47 years old, and he said, you know, Bob, everybody's asking me to t talk about how to 
improve urban education, how to turn the corner, how to make a amazing transformation. It's time for me to put up or shut up. And so he felt it was his time and his duty. And then he finally persuaded me. Uh, I didn't want to come as his deputy, but one day he appeared in my office and he had a number 10 business envelope. I was thinking about it today and I said, what's in that? He says, just a round trip ticket to Oakland. Just go and see and tell me you don't want to come. So, of course, I wanted to come after I came out and visited it. And I met with the Oakland Black Caucus uh, privately, you know, and met with other people that I knew and so we arrived in July of 1970 and had just three years. And he um, he had a social vision as a charismatic, articulate, gifted speaker. Um, it was common for people to say, well, he's probably, uh, you know, a Baptist or AME. I mean, you know, black folks, whatever. Actually, he was a Christian scientist mm. and had been raised by a, a single mom for the most part with brothers and sisters. And... Um, he just, I, for example, my daughter Samantha was a little girl then. Marx had taken one course when he was in his teacher training school experiences in children's literature. He remembered every story he ever read. Mm. He had told them to his own daughter. And when my daughter was a little girl, two and three, he would come to the house and she would run at him, just flinging herself at him. He'd scoop her up and start telling her some fascinating story. He just had a gift with kids. Um, that daughter is now a pediatric nurse practitioner and an educator, health educator. I, think, I like to think that Mark has had a very positive influence on her. Uh -huh. But that's the way he affected people. And uh, he was able to reconnect parents with their schools. He was able to tell teachers that you are crucial to this enterprise. I honor and cherish what you do every day. He was able to tell principals as a former principal himself. He was just nine months out of the principalship when he came to Oakland that he understood their work. He said to the principals, you're the superintendent of schools in your school community. And your your staff is your cast of educators, and your parents are your board members. And so, in so many ways, he involved parents and teachers in the life of the schools. He gave people hope. And um, to me, I mean, I went on to teach at Cal and Cal State, and my friends always teased me that I was teaching Marcus Foster 101 and 102. Wonderful. And that's what you do now, right? All right. That's what, what I have been your... doing. Right now I'm in semi-retirement. I work for both Cal and Cal State mentoring and tormenting young school administrators. And that's very satisfying work. I'm interested in the personal education of people who spend their careers in education. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about what your own personal educational experience was, how it shaped you. Um... My dad was an airline pilot, and I was born out here in California, but left at two years old and went back east. And between kindergarten and high school graduation, I attended 10 schools, mm. mostly public. My last years of high school were in a boys' boarding military academy in Texas that my grandpa owned. Then I went to Oberlin College in Ohio, and I had begun to become interested in civil rights in high school. And uh, living partly in the South, living partly in the North, I, I noticed the differences. And I found them intriguing and disturbing and interesting. And so I became more active in, in college. Then instead of going to France or something fashionable like that or to Spain, my junior year, I, I spent uh, a term at Hampton Institute, a historic black college in Southern Virginia. And when I finished college, uh, my wife and I got married uh, late in college, and we thought we would go in the Army, Air, I mean, in the Air Corps. Decided not to because the term became to be five years. So I looked around for what I really wanted to do was work in civil rights, and eventually got a job with the National Conference of Christians and Jews, the group that has foisted Brotherhood Week off on us. <laughs> and um, I, I enjoyed that work for them. That's what took us to Philadelphia. And I did a little teaching, particularly in, in a course called Problems of American Democracy. But mostly I was this youthful human relations guy. I went to Penn and got a master's in sociology and then in human relations. And um, very early on got this job as this boy executive director of the school reform group. And I mentioned that. I mentioned the work because everybody gets educated by their work as much as their formal schooling right and uh, eventually i finished a doctorate at union graduate school but i i learned 
a lot of things working in Philadelphia. It was a very interesting community. And then my real desire was to work in Africa for a period of time. And so I tried various avenues to do that, finally getting a job as a Peace Corps staff director in Somalia, in northern Somalia, former British Somaliland, where my wife, uh, Barbara, uh, and my son, Chris, uh, accompanied me. And we just had a wonderful two-plus years there. And then I came back and went to work finally for the Philadelphia Public Schools, handling desegregation, faculty integration, multicultural stuff, community and parent activism, all the messy parts, and worked closely with Marcus in those years, and then came to Philadelphia, and came to Oakland, and, you know, the formal schooling, as I said, you get you get taught by the jobs you're in, and I've also been <laughs> taught by three other gifted teachers. The first, my wife, Barbara, who's a native of Havana, Cuba and as a bilingual educator, and opened up a whole dimension for me about my understanding about what children need to be effective. And I suppose my second teacher was my son, Chris, who, you know, Margaret Mead <laughs> in the late 60s used to say, young people today don't want jobs, they want roles. And I began to see that in my own son's life as he went through the Oakland, I mean, Oakland schools and then down to Santa Cruz and took an interest in subjects that were of interest to me, but from a different perspective, anthropology and archaeology. And then I suppose my third teacher is my daughter, Samantha, who had a different experience, but ended up becoming a pediatric nurse practitioner after teaching for a while, and now, as I say, a health educator. And it's, you know, beyond my formal education, the education you get in your work, it's the people you live with who help um, shape your values and help uh, deepen your ideas and understanding of things. Uh, one of the first times I met you, you were, I believe, perhaps acting superintendent. You were speaking at a conference, and you talked. You opened the speech with a comment about white racism and how it was the most important problem in America. And <clears throat> I thought at the time, and still do actually, that it's not that frequent that whites raise issues about racism uh, sort of voluntarily and on their own. Of course, there are whites who are supportive of issues right. that are raised by African Americans or Latinos or whatever, but just to go in as a superintendent and open up a speech to an almost entirely white group of teachers with, uh, you know, racism is the most important problem confronting America, it was unusual. And I wondered uh, how, how that has been for you and if you continue to do that and, and, and what, what, what's that like? Well, I think um, along life's way we learn how deep the stain of racism is in our culture and our history and in all of us and uh, every honest person has to grapple with those issues, their perceptions what they were in the words of the old song, carefully taught as children and um, when I look at kids in Oakland or any urban area and I calculate what they will need to be effective in school and what the schools need to be to be effective for them, you just see, what, twice as many resources as we actually have and what keeps us from getting them. Well, you have in Sacramento, historically for the last 40 years, a group of in my view, self-contented white male educators who got good public education through the school system and the state university and college system. They got there, and now they see kids of color in the cities, and they think, well, what we give them is good enough. I mean, I really do think there's a deep mm -hmm. racism in the resource allocation. Think of a large institution which serves primarily people of color, whether it's housing, as in public housing, or job support, or education. And try to imagine a case where there's an overabundance of resources. Those sectors of, of our life are typically underfunded and undersupported. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the most profound effect of the subtle smoke of racism which pervades our culture. I wonder what you think about... You, you live in Oakland, right? Yes. And you continue to be active in Oakland Affairs. Yes. Uh -huh. I, I know right. you serve on the board of the Marcus Foster Foundation, which gives enormous uh, scholarships and incentives to teachers right. and young people and has right. been an important institution in Oakland for ever since Marcus Foster's death, actually. Right. Um, so I wondered if you could say something about your perception about Oakland schools at this point. Well, as an individual living in Oakland with kids who are well served by the Oakland schools by and large with uh, 
many close friends and colleagues who continue to work in the Oakland schools. I yearn for the time when the Oakland schools will be returned to the citizens of Oakland rather than being run by an outside temporary um, group of individuals. Um, many talented people have come to Oakland in recent years, but there's a sense of amputation between the people who are forming policy in Oakland and carrying it out and the parents and teachers of Oakland. Um, Marcus Foster used to say to the city mothers and fathers, you can't have a great city without a great school system. And um, and I believe, as a fellow named Joe McDonald at Brown said a few years ago, you can't build better schools on the backs of heartsick teachers. So there has to be a return to a sense of engagement and community with parents and teachers in the life of the Oakland schools. Um, I think there's some good things going on. I think some of the small schools are very exciting. I think uh, a lot of educators are working very hard every day, teachers and administrators, to make it more effective for for children. But I really think um, we are in oxygen debt as a community because we cannot, you know, govern and control our own school district. So there have been a lot of uh, explanations for why this was necessary, important, uh, had to happen, and so on. Are, are you, you're not impressed by any of the arguments no, about no. why it had to be a takeover no, and so on? No, I don't think so. I think um, elements of the polit- political leadership in Oakland wanted to control the district. They put, some years ago, the deputy city manager in control of the schools, and then it was... The district uh, appointed their own superintendent. Difficulties arose, and I think I think the whole state takeover could have been avoided. But now that we're, I'm not going to refight that battle now, three years later. But no, I'm I'm yearning for the day, which I hope is soon, when Oakland can reclaim its schools. We'll be talking more about the question of who controls the Oakland schools. Uh, in a few minutes, you're listening to Education Today, and I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. I'm joined in studio by former Oakland Superintendent Bob Blackburn, and we're discussing his personal uh, educational experience and his thoughts on the Oakland schools. So, Bob, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the question of who controls the schools. You said you thought the takeover could have been avoided, uh, and I might ask you to say a bit more about that. But uh, uh, if not to replay the history, so now there's at least a 65, approximately $65 million debt to the state. Um, I wonder if you see a mechanism by which in less than, you know, 40 or 50 years, <laughs> the Oakland citizens could control the schools again, and right. what, what would what would that mechanism look like? Well, um, there's no magic shortcut solution to that, but I look to the time when, an, when a mayor comes into the Oakland uh, community or comes out of the Oakland community who has a deeper understanding of the rich possible relationship between the city and its schools. And I look to a time when a mayor and a superintendent and a school board can sit down with the Alameda County legislative delegation to Sacramento and, and surrounding legislative colleagues and say, here's our situation. How can we address it in some useful way that will be honest to the citizens of Oakland and the citizens of California and shorten up the process of our deficit? Um, Right now, we are periodically complaining about the loss of ADA, that is average daily attendance, the number of kids in the district which provide the income. Each child brings so much money. Oakland money sent to the state and then returned. It's not state money. It's our own money locally. It just goes through a kind of a carburetor and comes back to us <laughs> from Sacramento. Um, but we are at the same time, we're going to have by next fall over 30 charter schools, each one of which takes all of the money that comes to a youngster and spends it. Many of them are private charters. Some of them are well-intended. Some of them are businesses. I think we've kind of gone overboard for that. As, as I said in other settings, Several charters are very interesting, very creative, and should be absolutely supported. But when a significant portion, what, eight, ten thousand of your kids are in charter schools, it's hard to get the finances together to pay down your debt mm-hmm. and to get back in the fiscal black. What do you think of, um, so there, here's this money that 
comes from the people of Oakland, goes to the state, comes back to Oakland, and Oakland has a loan on which it's paying interest. Does that make logical sense to you, the idea that we should be paying interest on money that came from us in the first place and is right. just going through this carburetor right. you describe? Right. I mean, right. I just wonder if that's yeah. a logical... You just, you just have to go further and deeper beyond the mechanics of that. Why was there a takeover? The mayor's office wanted to control the school system. The mayor had grand ideas, which he spoke about in his first campaign, for how he could improve Oakland schools. He has no personal experience in public schools, and so when he realized it was going to be very difficult to do, he formed a military charter school. And then because people were accusing him of believing that kids of color could only learn in those highly structured boot camp environments, he then formed this art school when there was already five arts high schools programs in Oakland. When, I, when a difficult period came and Dennis Giaconis, the superintendent, got some bad advice and they were facing a fiscal deficit, a trap was snapped. Now, Oakland was not permitted to use 30-some million dollars, which was due back from the state, whereas districts up and down California were permitted to use that money for teachers' expenses and the regular operating budget costs. Oakland was denied that. No other district was denied that. No directive went out from the state superintendent or anybody about that. So, in fact... Uh, between uh, Senator Parada and Mary Jerry Brown, they were able to have the state take control of the school district. And I don't want to dwell on that. That's history. But at the same time, people have to be very, very clear about why and what happened. So then you have um, the state control and a person who is accountable only to the state superintendent. So whatever parents want about keeping a school closed or opened or a different program or whatever, all that's... Uh, subject to one individual's, uh, you know, views. And you do think there's a political solution in spite of the financial problem? I guess oh, that yes. Oh, you do. yeah, right. I, I look to a day when we have a fully empowered board of education, an appropriately selected superintendent with broad interests in improving Oakland schools and a lot of experience and uh, someone in the mayor's office who knows how to join hands for example, a small thing that, that the mayor, uh, uh, a new mayor could do with the school board and the superintendent is annually call every organization in Oakland, churches, businesses, unions, PTAs, civic groups, betterment groups, whatever, together for a big get-together in the fall and say to every group, I want you to sit down and figure out with others what you, your group, your association, your club could do to support the improvement of the Oakland Public Schools. Can you volunteer? Can you provide services? Can you give money? Can you give technical assistance? Can you take kids? Can you what? What can you do? And then regather them in the spring and see how people did. Just combining the only urban districts in America which are really doing well are those where the city mothers and fathers join hands with the school board, the parents and the teachers, the administrators, and make common cause together. Without that, we're just picking away at it. Do you see urban districts that you do think are doing well? Can you mention well, I one think, or two? I think that Chicago has had some success with uh, you know decentralization and parent involvement and trying to do some things. The fellow who was in Chicago then went to Philadelphia. He's having a tougher time there. Um, I really, you know haven't um, kept track, you know, decentralization and parent involvement and trying to do some things. The fellow who was in Chicago then went to Philadelphia. He's having a tougher time there. Um, I really, you know, haven't um, kept track of those, but anecdotally I know that you can only make it when everybody pulls together. I mean, it stands to reason. When, I mean, when I first came to Oakland, people would say to me, older folks would say, oh, you work for the school department. And that's kind of a leftover phrase from another time of 30 years before that, 40 years before that, when the Oakland School District was a department of the city of Oakland. Mm -hmm. And um, we shouldn't be a department of the city. We should be separate. But there's no reason why we can't work together every day. Every agency and group in Oakland, every business in Oakland couldn't do more to help the Oakland schools. One of the things that I discover uh, often in the Oakland schools and other urban schools is that there actually are not teachers. There are not enough teachers. There are not teachers who have the credential to allow them to be in a particular classroom. Right. Not just that the school doesn't, that not just that the district won't hire them, but right. that they 
district is not allowed to hire them because they don't have whatever qualification. Right. I wonder if you could have any thoughts about Absolutely. what does it really take to be a teacher and what should we be looking for and how should we let people in and out and so on. Well, I, I, so we've been talking about Marcus Foster. Marcus Foster shut the school system down for an entire day and we all, as parents and teachers, 3,000 of us went to Sacramento and demanded more resources. Oakland teachers need better salaries, they need better working conditions, they need a lot of support, they need subsidized housing to live here and, you know, if there's the political will and a collaborative effort, that issue can be very effectively addressed. I have one last quick question before we end. I understand from the Fact Finders report that 30% of teachers leave the Oakland schools every year. Uh, it seems to have a really devastating impact on kids, and I wonder if you have thoughts about what impact it has or what can be done about it. I know you've mentioned salaries and, and conditions right. for teachers. but right. I don't know what the exact figure is, but within the first five years of teaching nationally, you know, somewhere around 40% leave the profession after all this work and training and effort. And I think it's not a prestigious position to, to occupy. I'm a school teacher. It's got to become one again. And part of that is just a factor of money. We live for 100 years off of women's energies as, you know, limited career opportunities. You could be a school marm or a nurse or whatever. And the profession just uh, f fed off of women's low-paid labor. And now it's just got to transform itself so it can be women's and men's high-paid labor. Do you see any hope for that? Do you I have do. an idea about how it might happen? No. California's whole financial thing is being examined by the, just been an announcement last week of a multi-billion dollar study led by a woman at Stanford about how are we spending our money in California schools? Are we spending enough compared to other states? We're 48th. So we've got to address this issue as a whole state. If you have questions regarding today's program, you can email us at educatetoday at earthlink.net. That's educatetoday at earthlink.net. I'd like to thank our guest, Bob Blackburn, former superintendent of the Oakland Schools and member of the board of the Marcus Foster Foundation. Thank you for being with us. The executive producer today is Kevin Cartwright. Our technical producer is Lawton Chan, and I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. See you next time. Ayurveda is the ancient science of life. This ancient science provides healing techniques that can make you love your life. Friends of Ayurveda is sponsoring an Ayurvedic stress management fundraiser workshop at San Francisco State University with the renowned Ayurvedic physician Vasant Lad on Saturday, April 29th and Sunday, April 30th to benefit the Ganesha Ayurveda Ashram Medical Center in India. For more information and to order tickets, please call 1-800-505-3887. That's 1-800-505-3887. And love your life through Ayurveda. Listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is just about 3 p.m. Stay tuned next for Cover to Cover, an open book.